Hi, everyone. My name is Jesse Fairbanks, and I'm a features programmer with DACA NYC. I'm very pleased to welcome you to a conversation with director Robert Yakovitz. Yakowitz, excuse me, and Richard Pete to talk about their film, In My Own Time, A Portrait of Karen Dalton. Welcome to Rob and Rich. Thank you guys both for being here and for sharing your film with Doc NYC's audience. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Thank you for having us. Yep. Thanks for having us. Very honored to be playing at Doc NYC. Mm -hmm. We're really thrilled to have just this really beautiful, poignant uh, profile of such a singular woman. Uh, I, I doubt that um, some people will definitely be familiar with Karen in this for others, this will be a, a moment of discovery, or they've been through the moment of discovery and now they know about her. And so thank you so much for making this film. Um, which leads me to my first question. Um, you know, this film is executive produced by Vim Vendors. It features Nick Cave and Bob Dylan. Um, you guys really have a powerhouse in terms of the different individuals that come together to weave a really rich portrait of this singular musician. Um, but as we experience in the film, there are not a lot of images of Karen or recordings of her performing. So what was it that made you want to make a profile of such an elusive figure with so little content to, to build off of? Well, we didn't know off the bat that there was such little content of hers. We thought we would like discover this like treasure of unfound footage or, or tapes or something and be able to uh, release that to the world. Um, but as you learned in the film, like, the, like there's very little out there of her already. And she was an avid cassette tape recorder. Um, and just after she passed away, the, her, her shed burned down and uh, ruined all of these tapes. So that was like the last stuff that, that she had personally recorded. Um, and then again, the little bit that we had found uh, was burned up in another fire in, in 2018. Yeah, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in a weird way, the lack of material that was available made it made us more curious um, and like more eager to try to explain the story in a way too. And just based on like her, her like Wikipedia and the information that was out there, a lot of it was incorrect. Like there was already like little docs on YouTube when they talk about how Karen died homeless on the streets of New York. And, and after our first interview, we like, learned that that wasn't true at all and, and got us excited about all the other little elements that we could find. Um, and then our first interview was with Peter Walker up in Woodstock and uh, he had all of her journals and diaries and, and we just spent days there from, from morning till, till night just reading these and photographing them and really feeling like we were getting inside of Karen's head. Um, so it was the perfect place to start. I think if we could have, if we would have started somewhere else and, and there was, you know, we didn't have this access or we just learned that the cassettes had burned up, you know, it might have um, slowed us down getting started. Yeah, I think with the lack of info or with the lack of materials, I think once we discovered the journals, then we knew that we really had something and it would be a key part of the movie and really helping to give us a good in intimate portrait of Karen, you know. Yeah, let's talk about those journals because they're so beautifully into the film, these nice graphics that write out her, you know, uh, write out her thoughts as there is spoken word of her, you know, interior journey. And it really helps create a sense of who she was since we can't hear from her herself. Um, it's so beautifully handled and I love the way that you also feature pages of the journal throughout of her journals throughout and at the end there's you know kind of a compilation of all these doodles and drawings that just you know really help create a sense of who Karen was and all that she struggled with. Um, so when did you know that the journals were going to be more than just something you pulled from in terms of understanding her but that you were actually going to use them as a visual language throughout the film. It was something we struggled with. We, we like knew that we wanted to incorporate them, but just couldn't really figure out how to do it visually or you know who could read them. And, and we ended up partnering with Angel Olsen and she did an incredible job yeah. just like interpreting the poems and giving them some personality. And then there was a, at one point we did a screening and we had really bold graphic text that was that her the, with the words that just kind of like took up the whole screen. And it was very controversial at the screening. Like some people loved it, some hated it. And ultimately we decided it wasn't like really in Karen's style or her, her voice. And, and we partnered with our friend, Mark Baker, and, and he ended up uh, doing the final graphics for us where she, we scanned her actual journals and, and 
um, he, he gave it that treatment that kind of felt like it was from the time period, but still um, was like visually interesting and, and really helped elevate the, the way that we told this, those pieces of the story. It's really beautiful and it works so well with the in-person interviews that you have with her daughter, Abby, and with her ex-husbands um, and the people that know her and love her. And then you also have the animation sequences for some of the more challenging uh, moments in Karen's life that we have absolutely no, there's no images or documentation of when she was getting married at the age of 15 and then again at 17 and um, you know other moments where she's dealing with her sobriety. Um, you know, so I'd love to hear just a little bit more about, you know, was there any point where you were like, okay, we're going to have spoken word text, we're also going to have animation, and we're going to have in-person, plus performative sequences, like, on paper, that sounds overwhelming, and yet the execution is so beautiful and authentic, it feels very organic. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Um, I think, you know, just to begin with, I think going back to like the lack of materials with Karen, and sort of something we discussed somewhat early on was just like incorporating all these different tools to tell the story in order to keep it interesting because the movie is sort of like slow paced. It's not like, you know, rapid cut, rapid fire sort of movie. So we figured our best bet was like just to incorporate as many tools as we can to tell this story and then try to sort of mold it into like, or like filter it through Karen's sort of sensibility to like give it that overall, you know, great feel. With, we worked with several. Oh, sorry, we worked with several different editors on the project too, and they each brought like their own style and voice to the project. And I think it was um, Ed, Ed Unitas, is an editor and good friend of ours. I think he was the first one that brought some animation elements to it. And there was at one point there was like some sequences with a Popeye, and he cut this incredible sequence together when Karen. Um, uh, is recording with the Holy Motor Rounders and she couldn't find her vein and she gets pierced and he edited this sequence together that has um, olive oil like ripping a sink off the wall and like getting really strong and it, it represented it so well but it was it made it sort of funny and although the story is funny it's like it's it's pretty dark too so we like ended up not staying in the film but um, it, it got us excited about animation. And I think, did he find that animation also? It's the one that we used? Oh, it actually came through another friend of ours, um, Kevin McMullen. Oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, Kevin McMullen, a director who Rich had worked with. Once we were sort of trying to figure out what type of animation we could use in the movie, he suggested this film called Windy Day, which is the animation we use in the movie, which is an experimental animation by uh, Faith and John Hubley. Um, and we were super lucky enough to sort of partner up with his ch their children who run their estate and they really worked with us and allowed us to use the footage and like they were so amazing and I think that footage or the, that animation really sort of just fits the movie wonderfully and like we couldn't have even we couldn't have recreated it better ourselves. Yeah. It's really incredible. Tango also. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> John and Faith Hubley's daughter, one of uh, their daughters is Georgia Hubley from Yola Tango, which is also a nice connection because they're also fans of Karen's music as well. So it's sort of like a nice little serendipitous thing that worked out there. It's incredible, you know, even though Karen's not with us, the uh, ongoing connections and reverberations from her work and her life that have led to what has been a very collaborative process behind the camera in terms of creating this profile. Um, which is, you know, she, she, she lived a larger than life and very messy short life as we see in the film, um, but her capacity to love um, was, you know, one of her hallmarks and it, it, it lives on. Um, talk to us that about what cool. it was- Incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah you got yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, talk to us about what it was like engaging her former husbands and her um, Abby and her granddaughter, as well as conversations that you may have had with other members of her family, and what it was like getting them to talk about some of the most challenging moments of their life. Yeah, it was we when we first decided to work on the doc um, or to really pursue it and, and make it a film. Uh, we, we tracked down Abby and she was working at um, a restaurant outside of Chicago. We, that was the only contact information. So Rob just was like cold calling the restaurant and, and got Abby and, and 
her initial response was just like, nobody's ever going to want to watch a movie about, about Karen. Like it's like not going to happen, but we just stayed persistent and, and um, eventually went out there to see her uh, for the first time. Um, I don't even know what year it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's just, it, it's tough. Like she's, um, she, she's very matter of fact. She's not very emotional. And, and like, you know, you get her and she can just talk about these things. And, and like she says, oh, it wasn't a kidnapping to me. Or, she, you know, these, these things that I think could feel really tragic. Um, she's, she's felt, found like a way to deal with them or, or has, it's been so much time or she just sort of boxed it away. So it was, it was like a little difficult from a filmmaker standpoint, like going to talk to her and not getting the emotions or something that you'd think you would, you would get from, from the subject when first going out there. I think actually Ab Abby says in the movie, which is a good uh, way to describe this. She says when she talks about Karen getting arrested, once she says, you know, and she had to go stay with someone else for a few days a foster family essentially she says well my childhood was so bizarre that going to stay with some stranger for three days like wasn't out of the ordinary you know what i mean so i think she's like just i mean abby lived it so it's like yeah they all did too when you're talking to richard tucker about her tooth getting knocked out he's just like he's like oh it's a terrible memory but like it's everything was so matter of fact like with with all of the folks we were talking to whether they're talking about like like abuse or, or, or uh, drugs and alcohol or you know mother-daughter relationship like it was all very matter of fact like people just sort of remembering it how it was yeah and um some people were hesitant at first it took a little convincing for abby richard a guy named dan hankin some of them had felt that they had sort of told these stories many times and they had been misquoted sometimes or just the facts just get mixed up over time so there were people that were hesitant and it did take some convincing on our end for some people, for sure. But I mean, ultimately we were persistent and we stuck with the project for quite some time. So I think they eventually realized that we were you know, pretty dedicated to getting it done. We weren't going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, we weren't gonna go away, so. <laughs> and like- I think we, it's pretty- Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was gonna say- I think the it's pretty... Oh, sorry, Rich. <laughs> Allison? <laughs> um, no, we said like we did have long, we were in course, had correspondence with Karen's brother as well, who was going back and forth about be being, you know, interviewed for the film, but he did give us a bunch of photographs and a bunch of materials and stuff like that. Um, as well as her son, we were in contact with on and off for a long time and went back and forth with him on interviews as well, but he um, is sometimes hard to get a hold of. I feel like we got the most emotion out of out of contemporary musicians who who just like understand Karen from her music and and the way that their music has affected them. Like it, it, they were the ones I feel like they were like really touched by her voice and and her her songs. Yeah, I think it's you know it's really incredible. It's a testament to both of you, um, especially since you know Rich and Rob, you are both men. That you made a film about a woman who could very easily be viewed as a tragic figure, as a victim, and instead the film actually shows her as a warrior and a fighter and a woman who lived on her own terms, who did not want to be defined by others. Um, who selected her lovers, who, who made her choices about parenting and about her career. Um, and that is, you know, it was trailblazing in the day. It still feels very fresh and original in these times, unfortunately, to have a woman um, be so unapologetically herself, mm -hmm. um, even though it cost her a lot emotionally um, and success throughout, throughout her life. But, uh, you know, I just, you know, there was something that really resonated with me in watching the film. Yeah, that yeah. was the point. Yeah, thank you. yeah, it's, <laughs> it's uh, tricky because she's not here to tell her story. And, and it was, uh, you know, it could have been very easily swayed in, in, into one of those directions. So it was, you know, we were walking a fine line and um, we were conscious too of, of, we talked to a lot of her like ex-lovers and we didn't want this to be a film that's like, Rob and I two men that make a, and are only interviewing like her it's like about her ex-lovers only and and so um it, that is also what took a lot of time just figuring out how to actually tell her story through other voices and through her voice and being able to be authentic to it 
right? How do you give agency to someone who's not here and yet who would have, uh, you know, very much so and adamantly requested her own agency? Okay. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where the journals come in, though. Like you said, that's like her voice really in the movie, aside from the few brief moments we hear her speak on the radio interviews, which is very brief. Um, I mean, the journals are her voice. So we just tried to, we really tried to pay attention to how we sort of curated those and like really laid them out to sort of be true to her voice and how we hope she would have felt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, I think yeah. again, that speaks to the fact that you had so many collaborators behind the screen with you, so many different women also working on the project and so many people who knew um, Karen herself who could um, perhaps you know, add add thoughts if if they felt like things were varying in a way that perhaps was not authentic to Karen. Yeah, yeah. certainly, absolutely. Peter Walker, who sort of run runs Karen's estate, he was a huge help with that. He spent you know the last years of her life with her. He spent a lot of time with her journals and poems. He was the person who was in possession of them, um, and he was a great help with that sort of going through those and trying to figure out you know those things. And then having Tracy and and Abby, our producers, they they were very hands on throughout the oh, entire absolutely. process. And and um, yeah, a Abby was the first person that that partnered with us. And and the the first trip up to go see Peter Walker, it was Rob and and Abby and I. And uh, Rob crashed the minivan into the side of a snowbank, and and it took like five hours to get out. And we were super late. And and uh, Abby. <laughs> kept it all together yeah. and and essentially how we like fell in love with Peter Walker and he, or he fell in love with us just like you know we were laying it all out there <laughs> yeah. yeah the van was like literally stuck mm -hmm. in a ditch like between a giant rock and the side of the road a tow truck had to put a giant line to it and rip pull it out, out. <laughs> yeah. Abby was probably like yeah this fits this fits yeah, with yeah. <laughs> it's like cool day one <laughs> Um, the last question for both of you is that, you know, this film is not only a biopic on the incredible Karen Dalton, but it also is a love letter to a very specific time in New York City when artists, um, when blues artists, when beat artists, beat uh, Nick artists were having a moment when there was a certain level of freedom of expression and mobility and um, some of the obstacles that musicians face now in terms of access and finance were not present. Um, you hear uh, Bob Dylan talk about that in the film and Nick Cave hints at it here and there, but why did you, why was it important for this to also feature, you know, a subplot of uh, this historical moment in New York's history? Well, I think, you know, that era of New York City is a huge part of Karen's life. It's sort of what helped her figure out her path. Like she knew what she wanted to do, but when she went to New York, even though things maybe didn't work out as she wanted them to at that time, I think just being around those people sort of helped her to understand the path that she wanted to take in her life and gave her an opportunity to meet other people that were doing the same thing. I mean, also aside from it being like, you know, just historically one of the most amazing periods mm -hmm. in time that everybody can fall in love with pretty easily if we're, they know enough about it. We're also both New Yorkers and it, it's like, you know, we, we love the history of New York in that time period specifically, but it's also fun, like we've both been there for like 15 years and, and you have your own period of time that you're there and, and um, it's just like, I don't know, it's, it's fun to just be a part of it and, and make sure that we're like helping tell the New York story as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the sense of nostalgia as someone who also spent over a decade in New York, it's, you know, our own experiences and then we hear these stories of what the city was like before us in so many different ways. And so um, it's just a beautiful addition. I know our audience really loved that. Um, I wish we had more time to talk about it, but thank you both so much for making a film about Karen Dalton. Otherwise, she would have been, unfortunately, probably relegated to the annals of musical history and uh, we wouldn't have known what an incredible uh, woman she was and what an insane life she led. Um, so please put your hands together for the directors, Robert Yakowitz and Richard Pete. Thank you so much for making your film In My Own Time, a portrait of Karen Dalton and bringing it to Doc and Lacey. Yeah, awesome. thanks for Thank having us. Thank you so us. much for having us. Mm -hmm. There's lots more Karen music out there. There's a new box set, go, go check it out. Oh yeah, there's a box set that just came out. You know, search the internet, check out all the music. <laughs> it's not all in the movie. 
We will do. Well, thanks, guys. And uh, um, tell everyone, tell your friends about the film. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you.